Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, September 10th, 2017. This is episode 1421. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Fracture. Fracture is a photo decor company that prints your photos directly onto glass and gets delivered right to your door, ready to display right out of the box, and it looks great. Visit FractureMe.com slash podcast for 10% off your first order. And don't forget to select the tech guy so Fracture knows you heard about it on the show. And by WordPress. Your customers want to find you. Build a WordPress.com website and help them connect with your business. Get 15% off any new plan purchase at WordPress.com slash tech guy. And by 23andMe. With 23andMe's genetic service, you can learn what percentage of your DNA comes from places like Italy, Finland, East Asia, or Neanderthals. Visit 23andMe.com slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, the new Apple phone coming Tuesday, or at least we'll hear about it Tuesday. The Note 8, which is shipping now, and I know some people have already got theirs from uh, Verizon and other carriers. I guess mine comes Tuesday. I'm excited about that. It's kind of ironic. I'm going to get my Galaxy Note 8 the same day that Apple announces an iPhone 8. We don't know. Actually, the rumor, uh, and I don't, I don't know if I believe it, but the, the rumor, somebody uh, has been going through the, a firmware leak for iOS 11 or a code leak for iOS 11, and has found references to an iPhone 8, an iPhone 8 Plus. That would kind of make sense. We know there'll be, or we think we know, because Apple doesn't say, but we rumors, rumor has it, there'll be three new iPhones announced on Tuesday. A successor to the existing iPhone 7 and 7 Plus, which, you know, could be the 7S and 7S Plus, but hey, iPhone 8 and 8 Plus makes sense, too. And then this uh, the same leak uh, talked about something called the iPhone X or iPhone 10. And I don't buy it. <laughs> uh, Apple, you know, I'm, I'm a bad predictor of what Apple's going to do. They do things, uh, they zig when they we think they should zag. And, and so far it's worked out pretty well for them. They're the most successful company in the history of all histories of the galaxy. But... Uh, they dumped, for Mac OS, they, they used to call it OS X with an X, right? And they stopped doing that. It's now called Mac OS. They don't have any products with an X in it anymore, and they got rid of the product that did have an X in it. On the other hand, they have a Mac Pro, an iMac Pro, and an iPad Pro. The one thing they don't, the MacBook Pros, the one thing they don't have is an iPhone Pro. So despite all the evidence to the contrary, I think it'll be called the iPhone Pro, but it'll be the 10th anniversary iPhone, so maybe I, iPhone 10, uh, maybe, I don't know. You know, you never know. Maybe they couldn't get iPhone Pro. Maybe some company in outer Slavistan owns it or something. But anyway, we'll find out on Tuesday. We got some bad news. <laughs> oh, man. We got some bad news uh, this week about Equifax. It, it's always irritated me that there are companies, four of them, that make their money selling my data, my information, without my permission, without any interaction on my part. You know, people yell at Google and Facebook, but at least with Google and Facebook, you know, you go there, you log in, you give them that information, knowing that, you know, they're going to use it to, to do ads, but Equifax, TransUnion, Experian, and Innovus are credit reporting agencies who collect every bit of information they can find about you, of course, your credit history, but everything else as well, and sell it without your permission or cooperation in any way. And I understand, I guess, we need something like that because if you're going to buy a house or rent a car or get a credit card, you need to have you know the, the people who are trusting you need to have some way to verify your your past, your history. You're not a deadbeat. And that's what happens. They, get, they pull a credit report on you. You give them your social, your date of birth, 
and they pull a credit report on you, and then get it from one of those four agencies uh, and pay them. Those agencies make a little money on the side, too, by selling your information to companies uh, who want to issue you credit card offers. You ever get a credit card offer in the mail? Well, you can thank Equifax, TransUnion, Experian, and Innovus, because that's how they know you'd be a good prospect. They go and they buy lists from them. So that already bothers me, and we talk so much about privacy, and we never mention that these guys <laughs> are doing this and have been doing this for years. But at the very least, a company like Equifax has a higher duty, a duty to, if they're going to gather this information, protect it. Because it's exactly the same information identity thieves need, bad guys need, to steal you, your, your, your credit, your money, your history. Heck, heck, they even have your address, <laughs> your net worth to rob you. <laughs> this is valuable, valuable information. And Equifax apparently did a terrible job in several respects. First of all... They were hacked. On July 29th, they learned that 143 million records had been exfiltrated by bad guys from the Equifax database. They got in via the Equifax website. Already, already there's a problem. It, 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 this, is not, this is not rocket science. We, we know how to secure this data in a way that bad guys can't use it. We know how to do this. And apparently Equifax didn't. So strike one. Strike two, they knew about it July 29th, but didn't tell anybody till just week, five weeks later. For five weeks, that information was floating around. We didn't know. Strike two. You know who did know? At least three Equifax executives who, after sometime between the time that information you know, the hack was discovered and the time they told the world and their stock price plummeted as a result, they sold their stock. Equifax said, oh, well, they didn't know about the breach. Their CFO, their chief financial officer didn't know about the breach. Hmm. Well, we'll leave that one to the uh, SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll have a conversation with them because that sounds to me, it sounds like insider trading. But, you know, we'll see. They'll have a conversation with them. I could, you could call that strike three, but I've got a better strike three. Then th this week, the Equifax, after announcing it, put up a website. I'm not going to give you the address because I don't want you to go there for you to determine whether you were affected by this breach. Apparently, I don't buy anything Equifax says, by the way, but apparently of the 143 million records, only a few hundred thousand had <laughs> credit card numbers and stuff like that. <clears throat> I somehow <clears throat> doubt that. And I bet in time, as time goes by and people investigate and Congress gets involved, and, you know, these numbers may shift. But they said, well, to find out if you're in that few hundred thousand, go to this website. Give us, this should be a red flag already. First of all, the website doesn't mention Equifax. So it looks like a phishing scam. In fact, it was blocked by OpenDNS for a while as a phishing scam. Give us the last six digits of your social. That's all but the first three and your last name, and we'll tell you, except that a number of people have put in random last names and digits and have had the same result. Uh-oh, you've been compromised. Here, have a free year of credit monitoring on us. A free year, which was, I'm sure on day 366 turned into a paid service. That's strike three, in my opinion. The Equifax... Having had this horrific data breach, having failed at the one thing they needed to do, which was protect our data, having gathered it without our permission, tried to make money on this. <laughs> they had the gall, the nerve, the chutzpah to try to make money off of us. Here, have some uh, credit monitoring. We'll talk to you again in a year. Do not go to the Equifax site. It doesn't give you information you can use. Assume that you have been breached. Do not sign up for credit monitoring with Equifax. One year it doesn't matter anyway because oh, the bad guys will just wait a year. They're patient. They'll wait a year, then use your data. Do, do the one thing they don't want you to do. Put a fraud alert on your Equifax, TransUnion, Experian, and Innovus accounts. That keeps people from using your information to apply for credit or to get a credit report. You'll have to lift it if you want to buy a house, rent a car. 
Sorry, that's kind of a pain. But And every three months, sometimes more often, you'll have to renew it. But that will, that will stymie a lot of the credit identity theft. And it's, to me, more importantly, sticks it to them because that's how they make money. You could go another step further, pay them a little money and put a credit freeze on there. Then they, then they really, oh, they hate that. That's why they ask for money. It won't be enough because that you're, what you kind of also want to do is monitor your, uh, your information to see if it's, if it's being spread around the Internet. And it's certainly every year at least, probably more often, you want to get it, pull a credit report from the big four agencies and find out if your credit's been compromised. This is, this is a nightmare. Strike three, you're out, Equifax. In this tight labor market, finding new employees can be tough. So, yeah, it's a WordPress site. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with that. It just they, they're clearly. Uh, either don't care or don't know or whatever. I mean, the, the, in the JavaScript, the guy login name was in the JavaScript. I mean, the whole thing is just a, a nightmare. Shouldn't have been hackable. Actually, appropriate song for... Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'll play it a little bit later on. One of, uh, one of uh, my inspirations, one of the great guys out there, a science fiction author, a, a computer columnist, a guy whose Chaos Manor column uh, really inspired my career. I read it religiously. Jerry Pornell passed away on uh, on um, Friday at the age of 84. Uh, American science fiction writer. He was. Um, I was. I had the pleasure of having him on my podcasts more than 20 times. So I consider him a uh, a good friend. Uh, just a really uh, talented science fiction writer. You. You may have read his uh, his many uh, science fiction books, his collaborations with uh, Larry Niven, A Moten God's Eye, Inferno, Lucifer's Hammer, Footfall. So many great books. It's wonderful reads, and I hope that this is an occasion for people to rediscover those books. But uh, also a great thinker, and I'm happy to say at least a part-time listener to this show, because I know that because every once in a while I get an e email from Jerry. Uh <laughs> Uh, saying Leo, you got it wrong, or reminding me of the history of something. Or it was just, it, it was just always an honor and a thrill. So um, we'll, we're sorry to lose him. Jerry Pornell passed away on Friday at the age of uh, 84. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. All right, and of course, of, as long as we're talking heavy duty stuff, and you know, our hearts and thoughts and prayers go out to uh, all of our listeners, not just now in in Houston and and and, and the Gulf in Texas, but also now in in uh, South Florida. And and the Caribbean islands too, and Cuba, and um, we were. I was going to the British Virgin Islands for Christmas. I don't. I don't know if I will be this year. And I, not only loss of uh, property, but loss of life. So, our thoughts are with you. Hang in there. And for those of you in Florida who are bracing for Irma, good luck. Good and stay safe, please. Uh, the phones are open. 888-827-5536. If you call, you know who's going to answer. This lovely woman here, Kim Schaffer. Hello, Kim. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry, I started such a somber note. Let's cheer up. Well, I'm going to go with the call that made me laugh the most. That sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Dina in Bless Manhattan you. Beach wants a uh, app where she can track her husband from her iPhone to his Samsung phone. But he knows about it, so I guess it's not... Hey, that's but, fair. But uh, <laughs> if you don't know the answer, a friend of mine is doing this with her daughter, so... Yeah, I, I, there's uh, lots of ways. There's probably lots yeah. of ways, so I have the name of one app. What's that? Uh, Life360, I heard. Oh, yeah, I've heard of yeah. that, yeah. She's got a Samsung, her daughter's got an iPhone. That's, and... a, that's a good one, yeah. Thank you, Kim. Right. Let's say hi to, uh, to Dina in Manhattan Beach. Hi, Dina. Leo Laporte, the tech hi. guy. Hi, oh, how are you? I'm wonderful. So you want to track your husband, huh? Yeah, I track my son and my dogs. So I wanted to track. <laughs> so, uh, if you think about it, a smartphone is is basically made to be a tracker. Because what do we have in here? We have an always-on internet connection. We have a GPS radio, which will tell you uh, where the phone is within three meters. Uh -huh. I mean, this thing is. It, it, not only that, I mean, it's got a camera, microphone, and speaker. I mean, this thing is the ultimate spy device. 
So, of yeah. course, you should have the permission of the person you're following. And if you do have their permission, it's a lot easier to keep track of them. Oh, you may not get to have permission. I still would do it. Yeah, yeah. So there's software uh, on there. Obviously, you're familiar. Uh, it sounds like you might do this even with your kids with uh, uh, Find My Friends on the iPhone. And, uh, yeah, and I have Find My Friend and I have 360 on my son's iPhone. Okay. So those but are. I don't have it on my husband's phone because he, I couldn't get it. To, I, the Find My Friends only for Apple. So yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to do something else. So we can, we can all know where my son is, basically. So. We can both track our son. I do really like. Uh, I really like this idea. You, I don't know if you read the Harry Potter books, but in one of the one of the books, there's a family that has a clock, but instead of showing the time, it shows the location of every member of the family. And when Dad comes home from work, the the big hand goes from work to home and things like that. It's just a really cool idea, and and absolutely there are ways to do this. Uh, Google Maps, for instance, will let you share your location. Um, that and everybody has Google Maps, so this works cross completely cross platform. But it does require the cooperation of the person you're tracking, so they can open okay. the Google Map, tap the blue dot that shows where you are, and then uh, the menu that pops up. One of the items on the menu will be share location, and you can say share this with mom and how long. I you know it does time out after a while, uh, but you can't. But you can if you wish say until uh, you, I turn it off. And, okay. and then that will be kind of permanent sharing. And then what you'll have is kind of like that clock. By the way, this is free and, it, again, completely cross-platform. It'll work on any device, including a tablet, um, as long as it has GPS in it or some sort of form of location finding. And, and then what you'll get is like that Harry Potter clock, your Google Map from now on will have an icon showing you uh, where people are. So I think that's that's a really uh, cool idea. It's like uh, like actually more like maybe the if we're going to stick with the Harry Potter thing. Remember that map that they found that showed everybody's location in Hogwarts, the Marauders map. It's kind of more like like that. So uh, to my understanding, that can be left on permanently. Although again, my suspicion is it will time out. So your husband or your son will have to turn that on uh, from time to time. Uh, I'm sure there are other uh, life is life 360 only on the iPhone that would be kind of uh, that's the that's the same idea um, let me just check here the idea is that you can it does crash detection emergency response but it also lets you know where everybody is no iPhone and Android so it is on Android as well so that would be even kind of maybe a better idea because uh, it's really designed to do exactly what you want to do, keep track of everybody in the family. The app is free. I would not be surprised if there is some uh, in-app purchase at some point. But it, uh, it will show you, uh, it gives you alerts when members of your family circle uh, get to the school or get to work, you know. Joey arrived at school. Joey arrived at work. Uh, it'll have distracted driving details. So if you have teenagers who are driving, that's really great. This seems like, ex this is, thank you, Kim. This seems like exactly the program for this. Um, invite only. Only circle members can see each other's members and locations. And that's, that's important because, uh, after all, uh, you know, this could be invasive if you don't have permission. I mean, maybe free, free. I don't uh, now that if it is free, then that makes me nervous because that means they're using, you know, nothing's free, free. If you don't pay money for it, then there's some way that they're unless they're, you know, great benefactors of humanity. There's some way they're making money on this. It costs money to do something like this. They may be collecting information about your location and selling it, that kind of thing. I'll look into this in, in more detail. In fact, I think I'll install it. This is a great idea. It it also for 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 new drivers. It's life360.com. Ah, it does have some paid option. Thank you, Evil Bob in the chat room. He said it's not free free. There's some paid options. You know what? That makes me feel better. I want it to be paid a little bit. That's that's better. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'm gonna I'm gonna install that. That's a that sounds like a great program. 
get everybody to use that. I tried to uh, Google uh, Android has a thing, um, trusted contacts that does the same thing, but Lisa won't do it with me. I had to check, but there is another program that is free. This one's from Google. It's called Trusted Contacts. We were talking uh, before the break with a mom who wanted to track her family, keep an eye on where they were. Uh, you know what? The Life 360 looks great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to install that. But we have a perfect uh, use for that. Our 14-year-old uh, tomorrow is going to use uh, public transit to get to high school for the first time. And uh, one of the things you can do is you can say, hey, uh, send me an alert. When Michael gets to school, so I know he made it. Because you can say, you know, you say to your kids, hey, tell me when you arrive. Call, you always said that. Call me when you arrive. But this way you can actually get, it'll automatically give an alert. Uh, but Google also has a program that's a little less, a little more straightforward. It's really just, you know, track people. It's called Trusted Contacts. And it is also iOS and Android. And what you'll do is you'll set up a connection with members of your family. It'll send them an email saying, I, you know, Leo wants to add you as a trusted contact. And then you can request locations. It doesn't track all the time. And one of the advantages of that, of course, is it's not going to drain the battery by keeping the uh, location on all the time. If everything's fine, you can say, you know, con trusted contacts can request your location. You can deny that. But if you, or if you can't respond, your last known location is uh, shared automatically which is kind of interesting. Or if you feel unsafe or find yourself in an emergency, there's a button there and you could proactively say, I'm here, help me. Your trusted contacts can see your phone's activity status too to know if you're okay, like you, you've been phoning or texting or using the phone. And it integrates with Google Maps. So this is probably an even better uh, solution that works with Google Maps uh, to keep track of loved ones. And as with all of these, uh, you know, you can't do this kind of sneakily. You have to request and receive permission but i think for members of the family certainly for for kids that's that's a great idea so trusted contacts free from google and we mentioned life 360 both work on ios and android 8888 ask leo that's the phone number as always with this stuff we'll put it on the show notes you don't have to write i know people are probably trying to drive and write please don't please don't we can't afford to lose a listener just uh, just remember this, techguylabs.com. That's the website, techguylabs.com. And uh, there, everything is uh, from the show is there. So James DeRuvo's writing. He's going to put those links up that I mentioned. So you can just go there anytime. And, and the website's divided into shows. This is episode 1,421. You can go there by number, but you can also go by date. Oh, yeah, I heard on Sunday or whatever. Uh, it, each show is divided into hours. Each hour is divided into calls and segments, so you can find it and you can drill down. It's completely wide open and free. There's no sign up. There's no. I certainly don't want your email address or your money. The only thing I would mention, and we'd love it if you leave comments. That's very helpful. So if I, if you have a third or fourth or fifth program, you say, "Oh yeah, here's another one that will do that." As an example, you can go to the website and leave a comment on that question, and that's valuable because it makes it richer and richer. The only thing you'll notice when you when you leave a comment, we ask you to sign in with your Facebook or your Twitter or your Google account, and that's just to really uh, prevent spam. Spam is such a problem in comments. Uh, you know, we just want to we just want to keep the spammers from splashing it all over our uh, pages. TechGuyLabs.com, free and always available. Uh, let's go back to uh, the phones. Jay on the line from Providence, North Carolina. Hi, Jay. Hi, Leo. I had a strange experience with a distant lightning strike recently. I lost not a bulb in the house, but I lost the cable modem and everything connected to it. Yeah. You know why? The bulbs connected to the electrical grid, uh, and that certainly is one source of uh, 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 power uh, problems because a surge in the electrical grid can fry any device, make light bulbs pop. I, uh, I have a friend, I was on the phone with her, Gina Smith, uh, many years ago. You know, she was in a lightning storm, and she, the house got hit, and everything, including major appliances like her refrigerator and dishwasher, got fried. And she had surge suppressors. They got fried, too, because lightning has such high voltage. It just jumps across fuses and so forth. So the reason your cable modem got hit is because it has another way for lightning to get in, right? It's connected to the cable which also goes out, up the telephone poles, around, and maybe, you know, it's just serendipity. The lightning didn't hit the power, 
Maybe it hit a telephone pole down the road and it went right down the cable into your cable modem. You're lucky it stopped there. It didn't hit your computers, did it? I think it hit your phone because it's, it's faded out. Yeah, you're just breaking it, breaking up. So here's what, I'll, I'll, but I know what your question is, so I'll, I'll answer it. Um, yes, it absolutely can do that. A, a surge suppressor isn't against lightning anyway. Isn't a guarantee. Surge suppressors are more useful against brownouts and spikes. Brownouts less so if you have a, a, a universal power supply or uninterruptible power supply (UPS). That'll help you with brownouts. That's a low power situation. You know, in the summer it happens when everybody turns on the air conditioning and the power goes down. That can be bad for computing equipment and other sensitive stuff like TVs. Or a high power condition, a surge or a spike. You get a surge sometimes when the power goes out and then they turn it back on, surges down the line. just like a rush of water and that can also fry delicate electronics. The kinds of UPSs and surge suppressors you get from companies like APCC, very good one, um, American Power Conversion, uh, Trip Light is another good one. Those work very well against those situations. But lightning, <laughs> that's all bets are off. If you if lightning, you have direct hit on lightning. You know you shouldn't be on the phone, for one thing. It can zap you through the phone line. It can zap you through the power. It can zap you through the cable. Uh, the best thing to do in, a, in that in the case of a lightning storm is is disconnect. So if you're in the middle of a, a or about to be in the middle. Probably should do this before the lightning storm comes, but about to be in the middle of a big lightning storm. Good idea to shut everything down and, and actually unplug it. Just it's not going to jump across the, you know, three feet of air, probably. So unplugging it would be the best thing. One of the reasons people buy surge suppressors and uninterruptible power supplies is many of them offer insurance if you do have damage. I've never taken advantage of that, and I don't know if Gina did. Probably her homeowners did that. There's something that you, there's covered it around. There's something you can do uh, that I've heard a lot of people recommend. Call an electrician and in, investigate whole home surge suppression because that that's an easier way to do it. Instead of trying to put surge suppressors on all the devices throughout the house, you put one at your connection to the main power line. One big old surge suppressor. It's really, I, I would guess, just basically a fuse. And should the power get too high, uh, it just cuts it. You may also uh, have be able to buy one that has some battery backup in it. You'd have to have a pretty darn big battery, though, to, to power the house. But in, inquire. I'm told it's not very expensive. Of course, you want a licensed electrician to do it, but it, I would not do it myself <laughs> unless you really know what you're doing because electricity, that's scary. But uh, whole home suppression is another option that uh, will be useful. But again, with, when, when you get, if you get a direct lightning hit, it's going to be hard to protect everything. Um, chat room saying whole home surge suppressors like about hundred bucks plus installation. It's very inexpensive, and uh, boy, they all they know all about it. They say it's typically MOVs, metal oxide varistors, essentially a fuse. In in the in you know, the basic idea of it. 8888 asked Leo, yeah, and if you are in a, in a lightning storm, uh, probably not a good idea while the lightning is all around you to pick up the phone or maybe even to go to the wall and unplug it. Unless you do it really quickly. <laughs> it is, and, and I, it's possible. It can blow everything out. Anything plugged in, it can blow out. But anything that's plugged in doesn't have to be plugged into the grid. It can be plugged into uh, your cable, right? Those go up telephone poles and down the road. Be a perfect conductor for lightning. 8888 ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up right after this. Good information from the chat room on these. Moves take one hit, no more than that. They absorb the energy. All right. Very nice. Metal oxide varistors. Jeffrey in San Diego is next. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, Leo. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. A couple things. One is a question at the end, but this is some information I think the listeners would like to know about if they don't. One is a couple plans. Uh, Metro PCS using T-Mobile's network has a $30 a month, no contract plan. They used to offer one gigabyte of unlimited at 4G and then, and then throttle it to two. 
and then, but now they've upped it for thirty dollars a month. You get, uh, and I'm not a spokesperson for these companies because I had the plan initially, but now I got the next plan. I'm going to tell you about in a minute or a second. Uh, so now it's two gigabytes at 4G for thirty dollars a month, all an unlimited call and unlimited text. T-Mobile, it's interesting, has another plan we've mentioned before, a $30 plan that gives you 5 gigabytes of data, but only 100 minutes of voice. Right, so right. if you don't want to make a lot of calls, and nowadays I don't, I don't use my phone hardly at all to make calls, uh, that's a good, a better data solution. So you have to, the problem with all of these plans is you've got to figure out how, how do I use my phone? Do, is data more important? Is voice more important? Is texting more important? And yeah, the, these, there's some very good plans, especially from... This is uh, this is uh, Metro PCS is what we call an MVNO, which is a reseller of T-Mobile. Yeah, uh, one more plan I wanted to mention: T-Mobile, which is the plan I have because I'm not a data user, has a three dollar a month plan, and for you and you get for that it's a three dollar minimum a month prepaid plan, no contract of course, and you get uh, a combination of uh, 30, 30 minutes uh, or text messages, which is one text message equal to a minute, at 10 cents a minute. for So you $3 a month, you get 30 combination of those. And after that, if you go over that in your month, you pay 10 cents for a message or 10 cents for a minute of phone call. It just proves that it's a good idea to know what you want to do with your cell uh, subscription and pick one and shop and research because they're... There, that, this is in some ways, remember like the uh, how complicated airline fares have gotten thanks to com computers. It's gotten that way. There's so many carriers and so many different plans. You really have to spend some time. Don't forget Straight Talk, which offers some interesting plans as well. Well, well thank I, you. Thank you for the I, tip. I, had, I appreciate I had one that. question. Can you hold sure. on a second? Uh, my, my Samsung S4, uh, every now and then it says uh, I need to restart the phone because the SIM card's not recognized. You probably have a loose SIM card. That happens sometimes. I would uh, open up the uh, phone a little bit, reseat it, make sure it's really in there. Sometimes uh, it loses track of the SIM card. If that keeps happening, though, you know, you've opened it up and you make sure the SIM card's really in well. By the way, opening a SIM slot, I presume you've all done that, right? The, be careful because the there's a little hole and then um, kind of a rounded rectangle around it that's the SIM slot. But that hole is exactly the same shape and size as other little openings on the phone, some of which you really don't want to poke anything in. For instance, the microphone. It would be a bad idea. If you don't have a, uh, and most phones come with a little SIM. You've seen that metal thing probably. I would bet you a lot of people look at it and go, I have no idea what that's for. It's That's what that's for, so popping out a SIM and putting in a new one. Uh, if you have one of those or a, a small paper clip, you can pop it out and make sure it's in there really well. If you're at all nervous about that, take it to the phone store. Probably be the best advice. And I, it is the case that SIMs can go bad or can be damaged. And uh, if you keep getting this, it's probably the case. But the good news is you can go to T-Mobile and... Uh, I, I can't remember. I've done this. I can't remember if they charge you five bucks or they give it to you for free. But for a, a low cost, if, if, if any, they'll replace the SIM. In fact, that might be the best thing to do. If you keep getting that warning, that's probably the best thing to do. You just have, you have a SIM maybe with some bad contacts. It could be loose. It could be an easy fi thing to fix. Um, look for uh, either either bring it into the T-Mobile store or if, you, if you're ambitious, pop it out. Make sure it's in there really good. Put it back in. See if that fixes it. Scott in Denver, Colorado has been bit by the grim. What is, this is, uh, well, hello, Scott, first of all. Hi, how you doing, Leo? A va is, is, is Avast reporting something called the Grim Fighter on your system? No, it's Grime. Grime, grime. Fighter. Grime Fighter, yeah. wow. Yes. Yeah. So Avast and is what a... What it is, I was on Yahoo, and then I went to one of those sites, like Beat Jiminy, but it wasn't. I was watching information about the Pawn Stars on the History Channel. And then I noticed at the bottom of my toolbar, uh, there were like, oh, I don't know, well over a dozen little windows that hit. Okay. So first of all, Avast installs something called the Grime Fighter. That's part of Avast. This is yeah. incidentally why I don't recommend antivirus solutions. You well, have an antivirus well, solution. It's on there. It didn't protect you because you do have well, something. And what it's done is taken over my computer. Yeah. So please, folks, listen don't put antiviruses on your system. 
They, in fact, often open holes in your system. They give you a false sense of security, and you're going to still get bit, you know, three times out of five. That's, yeah. that's about how they're, they're only about 30 percent accurate in many cases. For instance, the WannaCry virus, only about one third of the antiviruses out there detected it. And that was, you know, those same third won't detect a different one. So it's a, it's a deception. Now, once you've bit and you clearly bit, you can't use your mouse, you can't use your keyboard, you can't do anything. It only opens on the Avast Grime, or Grime Fighter. It will not open Windows. I've done, I've tried F8, I've tried F12. Um, I called the VAST. They had me do basically the same thing, only they had me remove the battery and reinstall it. It's all to know there. Did you pay for a VAST or is this the free version? No, I didn't. I, I did not authorize this thing to even be installed. I got a phone call when I was deleting all these little windows. And I left the mouse on one of the windows, which I'm assuming was this one. I took a phone call from family in Simi Valley and came back, and this, this was on my, my, my computer screen. Well, I went ahead and I shut it off because I had to go to a job site. And when I returned a couple hours later, I now I went to – every time I try to open it, it just goes to a bath, and it says – Sedating your PC, <laughs> then it has has the task bar, and it's oh my gosh! All right, well, le nice lesson thing. learned. Don't install the. So you, you never installed a VAS in the first place? No, I did not. Oh, interesting. So one of the things bad guys also do is imper impersonate antivirus software. So a VAS, which is a well-known, both free and paid antivirus solution. Uh, does have a tool called Grime Fighter. That's part of Avast. But maybe you don't have Grime Fighter on there. Maybe you have a malware that just calls itself Grime Fighter. At this point, you're in such bad shape that you need to reformat your hard drive and reinstall Windows. Now, there's a, a bigger question because on there you have data that you probably don't want to lose. So this might be a case of bringing it to somebody who knows what they're doing, get them to pull the data off your system, and then format and reinstall. You're in pretty bad shape here. That's the best I can do from a distance. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You have a vivid imagination. <laughs> the thing under the twit hat that looks like a male bedside urinal. All right, I will, um, I will turn it slightly. Is that, is that better? <laughs> now it looks like a uh, male bedside urinal with eyes. It's a, uh, it's a plants versus zombies pea shooter in clay, ceramic. Hey, speaking of ceramic, wouldn't you like to print your next photo on glass? You can, uh, not with your printer. Probably should get the experts to do it. It's called Fracture, and it is awesome. If you go to FractureMe.com slash podcast, you get 10% off your Fracture order. Let me show you. I actually have uh, some Fractures. We ordered a bunch of Fractures. They print your photo right onto the glass. They add a laser-cut rigid backing, so it's ready to mount or display right on. Or in fact, it comes in a, in a container with, with a screw. Well, let me show you. This is the best way to do it. It comes in the container with a screw and everything you need to, to hang it right on the wall directly. And the sizes, they're just wonderful. Let me get out a few of these to show you. It comes in a very nice packaged box so it won't get damaged. Ugh. So let me pull a few of these uh, out here. Whoa, all different sizes. So this is the smallest size. This is cute. This is a little, I think it's a four by, basically four by six uh, that we did of uh, Michael's uh, eighth grade graduation. And it's, here, I'll show you up close so you can, you can see it. It's really, really pretty. Uh, notice, though, this is the backing. See, there's the, uh, the, the screw. And then you, you pull this off. It's ready to hang. And that's it. It looks beautiful. That's the smallest size, but they range in, uh, there are many different sizes. Uh, here's a print uh, of a uh, shot that Lisa took of me in Machu Picchu. I'll pull it out of the backing so you can see it. So it's 
borderless, full bleed. I, it's hard to describe, and you're probably not seeing the best uh, results on camera for those of you watching video. And of course, if you're listening, you're not seeing anything. But you got to see this to believe it. There's something about these pictures. They come to life on glass. They're vivid. Here's a black and white shot that I did of my uh, son and daughter. It just, it just, and I made it, I had, a, I kind of printed it in a kind of selenium kind of gray. And it just, it looks so much better than on paper. Fracture Me is very affordable. You want to see the biggest one? <laughs> all right, get ready. Because <laughs> it goes all the way up to 21.6 by 28.8 inches. And if you've got a picture you took that you just are so proud of, you can't, you can't resist it. This is this is it. This is this is my shot of the year from our trip uh, last uh, spring, of a seal and a, a flightless cormorant fighting for a space on a rock. But look how big that is. This is suitable for hanging over the mantle. It's awesome. Now I chose a black border on these, but uh, you don't, you can do it borderless. You have an advanced editor. You can change it to black and white. There's all there's sorts of things you can do it with it. It uh, it normally defaults to a four by three aspect ratio, but if you have a, as this was a three by two picture, you could just change the crop. Go to the advanced editor, undo the uh, the automatic crop, and resize it. You can change the border. To, you can have all different color borders, and they're gorgeous. They pop. It's a great gift too, by the way. Uh, I'm gonna. Don't tell my kids, but I'm going to give each of them uh, this picture of my son and daughter. This was at Henry's graduation. Um, what a great gift to, to give. Each comes with a 60-day happiness guarantee. You love your order or they'll return your money. You just you know They're just great about this. They're, they're handmade in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, so it's U.S. made, and it's and it's just really great. U.S. source materials, a carbon neutral factory. You'll feel really good about your fractures. Bring a special memory to life. Give it as a unique gift. Decorate your home with moments that tell your story. It's one thing to have a photo book or have all your memories in Google Photos. It's another thing to have them up on the wall. It's just if you've got a picture you just love, you've got to go to fractureme.com/slash podcast get 10 percent off your first order make sure you select the tech guy in the drop down there where i think it's a checkbox so fracture knows where you heard about uh, the the company and it helps support the show and we just love them and i tell you what just get one get you know, as many as you want if you trust me get as many as you want because i promise you you will love these and of course they have a satisfaction guarantee but uh just if you if you're not sure get one and you will it will blow you away you'll you'll want more fracture it's at FractureMe.com slash podcast. And uh, don't forget to choose the tech guy for 10% off your order. These are I, just, I, even the little one, it's so cute. You know, what Lisa does, which is great, is we, we put um, a molding up on the wall so we can change the pictures easily. They're not hanging. They're just, they're kind of like a gallery as you go down the hall. And so these are, these are perfect. And there's something about the, the glass. It catches the light. The contrast is better. It just brings it to life. The color is vivid. I mean, look at the color on this one. This is the train ride uh, to Machu Picchu. I just, you know, I, I, when we get back from a trip, one of the things we do is uh, we print them all up on, on Fracture and, and get them up on the wall. FractureMe.com slash podcast and let them know you heard it on the Tech Guy show. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater, digital photography, smartphones and smartwatches, augmented reality, the new iPhone, the new Galaxy Note, uh, the new Essential phone, the new Google Pixel phone. <laughs> what else? The new Motorola X, the new Motorola Z, the new, I can go on and on. There are, uh, this is the, you know, this is the, uh, the uh, month time of year when all the new phones come out for the most part because uh, they want to hit you for the holiday buying season i guess i don't know maybe it's just you know i think apple probably started this when they first announced the iphone they announced it in january the very first iphone in 2007 it came out in june 2007 but ever since they've you know slowly migrated to a september announcement and a late september early october release and probably that's I would admit, yeah, really, that's why all the other ones come out at that time, too. <laughs> Just, well, that's what Apple does. Must be, it must be right. Uh, Apple will have its event Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific time, and it'll be the first time they've used their own theater in the brand-new campus. 
the new Apple Park campus. That's the spaceship campus, we call it, because it's a perfect circle. Huge. Just looks like it was, you know, spaceship landed. And they built separate from that something they call the Steve Jobs Theater in honor, of course, of uh, one of their founders and, uh, and a guy who perfected the art of product announcements. And so they'll be in there for the first time. The theater holds a thousand people, uh, of whom only about 350 will be journalists. The rest, 650, will be Apple employees. And that's important to remember because when you watch this, and Apple will live stream it, there'll be lots of cheering and applause for, you know, and, and if you watch it and you think, wow, people are really excited, understand that's Apple employees. And the, re and the reason they filled that place up with Apple employees is to make it sound like everybody's so excited about this new thing. It may not be that exciting. I've, I've been at Apple events where they announced iPod socks. Little, I'm not kidding. This was a product. Didn't last long. To fit your iPod sh Nano or Shuffle, and I guess it was for the Nano, they were just basically, they were socks. But that didn't stop the crowd assembled from going, yeah! Socks, finally, for my iPod. So it's if you watch these events, and I, I watch them. In fact, we, we, do a, we do a little live stream. We, we, we stream ourselves watching and talking about the event on my podcast network, twit.tv. If you want to watch it, we'll be doing that live. You can, you, you know, you'll, you'll hear the Apple event, but you'll also hear our comments. I just want to warn you that we'll be talking. But, uh, and maybe that'll give you more perspective because uh, we will, I'm excited. We'll be excited, but we'll also talk about the downsides. For instance, one of the things we expect in this new iPhone, Apple really, uh, along with everybody else, wants to make the screen bigger without making the phone bigger. And really, the only way to do that is to get rid of the frame, we call them the bezel, around the screen. If you look at your iPhone, current iPhone, you'll notice there's a you know a big chunk of real estate at the top and the bottom that's not screen. It's the camera, the speaker, the touch ID button. And there's a thinner bar on the left and right, and it's to hold the screen in. But technology is advanced to the point now where many companies are making phones, Samsung most notably, that go all almost all the way to the edge. There's very little bezel. And the advantage of that is you can get a, say, six and a half or six point, I'm sorry, a five and a half or a 5.7 inch screen on a device that's noticeably smaller than the, the big iPhone. Easier to hold in the hand. You get all the benefits of screen real estate without, you know, a giant phone. That seems to be what people want especially as we use the phone more and more as a computer and less and less as a phone. But you want to be able to pocket it, carry it easily, hold it in one hand, manipulate it with your thumb and that kind of thing. The only problem with that is that's, that's where Apple keeps the home button is on that big chunk of real estate at the bottom of the screen. You get rid of that, where are you going to put the home button? Well, you can put the home button on the screen, but the home button is, has dual purposes. It also is a fingerprint reader in the latest iPhones. Touch ID, Apple calls it. That's going to go away. Apparently, for uh, the early part of this year, Apple worked very hard to figure out a way to have the fingerprint reader be underneath the screen. So you would put your finger on the screen, and it would sense it through the glass and unlock the phone. The story, and it's been widely reported by a number of people, I think it's probably true, is that Apple couldn't make it work. And it delayed a little bit the production of the newest iPhone, the 10th anniversary iPhone. They won't have a fingerprint reader on the front or on the back. They're just not going to do it. Instead, they're, you're going to unlock the phone in a way that will be a lot easier with your face. They're going to call it Face ID instead of Touch ID. And we'll talk more about it next week. But it sounds like the way it's going to work is that the phone, you won't have to kind of put the phone in front of your face. You do have to do that now with face recognition tools from Microsoft, they call it Microsoft Hello, with the face recognition in the Galaxy S8, you kind of have to you know, position the phone in front of your face so it can see your face. If you're wearing glasses, it can be confused. If it's dark, it can be confused. It's not a perfect solution, but if Apple's going to replace Touch ID, which works every time quickly and easily with face recognition, it better work just as easily and just as quickly. So it's my guess, unless, you know, this is a flop. It's my guess that this will pretty much recognize you anytime it can see your face. 
And the phone will, in effect, be unlocked in your presence. It'll just, you know, oh, that's Leo. Unlock for him. This raises a couple of interesting security issues. And I, and I think it'd be very important, and again, we'll talk about this next week after the event and when we learn more about it. And I'll talk even more once I get the phone because that's really going to be the proof of the, of the pudding. It's, it's, it's testing it. But the, the concern is that, well, if, if, if you're sitting next to the phone and it unlocks because it sees you and then somebody grabs it, it's unlocked. If law enforcement or a bad guy decides that they want what's on your phone, and remember, you know, lots of valuable, important stuff on here, all they would have to do is put it in front of your face and then pull it away. There's even the issue, which which means that, you know, they could unlock that phone really without your consent. Just mm, shine, shine it on your face and go, thank you. It's a little harder to get somebody's finger on the fingerprint reader. There's also some concern that it that it doesn't protect your phone in the way a passcode will. Not, not only is it not as secure, uh, law enforcement doesn't need a warrant to look at your phone. They just hold it up and then say, good, thank you for that, and let's look at it. And we know they'll do that sometimes. There, there's some people that will do that. So uh, people who really want to enforce their privacy are probably going to want to turn off the face ID and turn on a passcode. That's the safest way to uh, store your stuff on any phone. That's going to be, I think, one of the more controversial uh, features of this. But it'll be interesting to see. If Apple gets it to work, I think everybody will use it because it'll be so convenient. You know, it's sitting on a desk. It, it sees you. It unlocks. You just pick it up, and it's ready to go. It'll be so convenient. But I, I, it'll, it'll be on me to be the Grinch here and say, well, but it's not secure. So maybe you shouldn't use it. I suspect everybody will use it. Somebody in our chat room, David, says, well, it's easy. Make a crazy face to unlock it. And then it'll only unlock when you make that unique, one and only crazy face that only you know how to make. Actually, that's a very interesting idea. I'll try that right away. <laughs> See if it works. That's a very interesting idea because nobody would know your crazy face. They might think you're kind of crazy if you make that crazy face every time you want to use your phone. But I guess that would make it a little bit more secure. There's also the issue that apps that are currently using Touch ID, things like Apple Pay, you know, your credit cards. Apple, are they going to, I think Apple will just say, well, we, we Touch ID and Face ID, it won't matter. You can use Face ID to unlock your credit cards. Eey, that makes me really nervous. We'll wait to see what the security community says about it. Says about it, and we'll wait to see what Apple says about it this Tuesday. We'll find out. All right, back to the phones. 8888-ASK-LEO, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So, John, here's the, uh, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number. If you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, you want to talk high tech with me, that's what I'm here for, my friends. G uh, Gabby or Gabby in uh, San Diego. Hi, is it Gabby? Yeah, Gabby. Hi, Gabby. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I just had a quick question. Um, so we're trying, my mom and I are trying to transfer VHS tapes over to my laptop, like kind of digitize them. Like home videos of when you were a baby? Yeah, exactly. Fun, <laughs> fun. So we bought um, kind of like a little device. It's called the Diamond One Touch Video Capture. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with I it. I am, yep. Yeah, so we bought that, and then so I connected everything, and I connected it to my laptop and the VHS, and then when I but when I play the VHS tape, it plays so it plays on the TV, but it doesn't play on the laptop. Like on the laptop on the video um, software, yeah, all it says is or it doesn't say anything. It's just a blue screen, but it plays on the TV. So I don't know what to do in order to have it play on the laptop so I can record it and then transfer it over. Yeah, so you have to use their software. And you mm -hmm. have, you know, the video capture software, and you're doing that, right? Yeah. Um, so it sounds like the computer is didn't see the device. The device connects to the VCR. The VCR is supposed to play out of the back of it. Now, you said you can see it on a TV. How is the TV connected to the VCR, and how is the diamond connected to the VCR? So the um, 
the diamond recorder is connected to the VCR through the like the, the yellow, red, and yellow, white. Yellow, red. Okay. Yeah, those cables. Yeah. And then that's how the VCR is connected to the TV as well. So you had two sets of those. Uh. Yeah, so it's the set that comes with the uh, diamond recorder, and then it's the set that came with the VHS. But you have two of them on the back of the VHS tape, the tape uh, player. So there's, I mean, how? in other words, yeah. normally you, you would unplug the TV, and re, and the same connections on the VHS player that your the TV was using would be the ones you'd use with the diamond. If you have a dual set, do you? Yeah, so, okay. well, because there's, like, three different sets for those cables. Okay. So we have them. Um, so, so there's a couple of possibilities. One. Remember, I'm doing this blindfolded, in effect, but there's a couple of yeah. possibilities. <laughs> one, the VCR, it's unusual for VCR to have multiple outputs like that. So okay. there may be a setting in the VCR that says which one you should use. You might even try okay. disconnecting the TV. You shouldn't need the TV because okay. when you run the Diamond software, it should see the output of the TV through that diamond box on your screen. And actually, it has to. Otherwise, you won't be able to capture it, obviously. The uh, other possibility is that when you installed uh, when you installed the diamond, you did it in the wrong order. It's a USB connection to the laptop. And this mm -hmm. is one of the negatives about USB. You have to install the USB software first and then plug the thing in. Did you, or do you remember, when you plugged in the USB connector, did you hear it boom, boom? Uh, <laughs> you know how Windows goes, when you plug in something, the USB goes boom, boom. And then when you unplug yeah. it, it goes boom, boom. If you didn't hear the um, boom, boom, they didn't see it. Okay. I think, well, because the sound on my laptop doesn't really work. <laughs> So, but the, it comes like there's a little notification that comes up whenever it's plugged yeah. in. And I know like I installed it before. Okay. So, so. you put this, you install, always install the software for city. It'll have a label yeah. on there. It says, oh, stop. Don't plug this in. Because <laughs> this is just a, a, a failing in, in the way USB works. So you install the software. That, what that does is that puts something called a driver on the laptop that says, here's how a diamond one touch works. And here's how you can display its video. So, uh, you 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 connect the TV. I would say disconnect the TV. Output the VCR into the diamond USB device. The TV may be confusing the VCR. The VCR may not be able to play to all the different outputs, and so it may be choosing one. Look in the VCR. You know, these things didn't have menus, but there might be buttons on it that say which to play. You only want to have the diamond, obviously. And the fact okay. that you're so you're seeing a blue screen. So, yeah, so... Yeah, blue screen is, means I'm getting video, but I'm not getting video. Okay. So, so, so when you go boom, boom, and you plug it in, that's good. It's seeing it. It pops up the little uh, dialogue that says, I see the Diamond One Touch installing software or whatever, and it's working. But you're still not getting a video picture. It's because a video picture isn't being output from the VCR. So disconnect the TV. I bet you that's the problem. Okay, perfect. I'll try okay. that. Thank you so much. Oh, how many videos do you have? Uh, a lot. My mom has a ton. That's so. <laughs> you are so lucky to have those. And <laughs> well, you... they're mostly of my brother. So. Oh, was he the firstborn? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. Was. See, that's it's it's terrible. But the firstborn gets all the pictures, <laughs> all the videos, and you're the secondborn. It's like, yeah, yeah, we yeah, okay. The phase is over. Yeah, this phase is over. Exactly. Um, it's okay though. Yeah. So so right. you get connect the diamond directly to the VCR and nothing else, and I bet you you'll get a picture out of the VCR. And then you and you're really smart to digitize all these because those tapes will degrade after a while. They, but once you have it digitized, you know you can keep it, you can share it with your brother, you can make copies, you can make backups. You'll never lose the video. And you may you're young still; it may not mean that much to you. But I'll tell <laughs> you what: in 20, 30 years, you're going to be thrilled to have those videos. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Thanks for calling, Gabby. I, I I suspect there's a routing issue. Most VCRs really only have one output. It's going to the TV. Uh, that's what the output you want from the VCR. That'll give you the video. Mike in Maine, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Mike. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm well. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. You know, there's another issue with the Face ID thing with Apple that you didn't bring up that may or may not be a concern, but it means the camera's always on. 
Well, I that's you know we don't know. I agree. That's a really interesting question, and that would kill the batteries. So I, it's my suspicion that there will be some way of triggering the face recognition, and that means immediately it won't be as easy to use as as we'd like. And this is this is the big question mark with this iPhone eight. I I don't think they wanted to do it this way. I think they had to, and I think it may not be great. On the other hand, you'll have a beautiful screen, so it might be a, a worthy trade-off. I'm gonna on mine. I'm gonna use the pin code. I'm not gonna use a face recognition, but we'll see. That makes sense to me, and I love you guys watching you guys watch the whole Apple rollouts. It's like mystery science theater. <laughs> it's exactly right. We should have just a little cutout. So it'll be uh, uh, Jason. No, I'm sorry, uh, Alex, Lindsay, Megan, Maroney, and, and me, and we'll be watching it. And I'll try not to be too snarky. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, please, go overboard. The snarkiness well, I, is the best I don't want to be snarky, but at the same time, I like to cut through some of the adulation and, and, and raise issues like this. Like, well, how is this going to be triggered? Uh, some renders have had an extra button. Uh, or, uh, m more likely, the what we think of now as the screen on-off button will be serving multiple duties. Uh, you know, Leo, you are our detector of bovine excrement. <laughs> I hope so. We need to remember that. <laughs> Thank you. Responsibility. Mike, hang on. we got to take a break at the bottom of the hour. Okay. We'll come back with you in just a second. Uh, TechIlabs.com, that's the website. Phone number 8888-ASK-LEO. Proud to be your detector of bovine excrement since 1992. More right after this. Ah, that magic music from Paul Simon heralds the arrival of our favorite photographer, Chris Marquardt, the photo guy. Chris leads workshops. Actually, uh, we're recording this one ahead of time because you're in Norway. Is it for a workshop or for fun in Norway? This is for uh, finally a real vacation vacation. Oh, Monica wow. and I are on a vacation without a photo group, and this is very exciting. Wow. So yeah, we'll be up in Norway, Lofoten, Norway, beautiful area, and we're... We're probably seeing some northern lights and some some interesting photography, and it's just us. But I know you. You're bringing your cameras, both you and Monica. Oh, oh totally. Yeah. Monica as a photographer. I'm a photographer. Of course, yeah. we do. Yeah. But it's just it's just a different thing if you are if you travel somewhere and you do it uh, with a group. I love doing that. I love uh, doing the photo tours. But then if if Monica comes, then she's always not as important as she should be. So <laughs> I'm. I'm you and your this, honey. Yeah. You know what? My wife is also an avid. We're both avid amateur photographers, and we really that's the that is a fun hobby to have if you, when you travel. Oh yeah, it's either you know for most people either shopping, eating, or photography. <laughs> it's also a good hobby for both to have at the same time because you as a photographer, I always say photographers are sticky. They get stuck at like every exactly. corner because there's drives, something. There's a bit of chewing gum on the street, crazy. and you and you just yeah. stand there and. Just, and it drives people crazy. So it's good to be with and other then, photographers who understand. Exactly. Yes. So that's that's what we're doing up in Norway. <laughs> have fun. Have a great time. I have a question. I for brought. You. What oh, did yeah, you sure, bring? Go ahead. Well, I was going to. I brought. A, <laughs> you brought a, <laughs> a, what? A lens, I think. Yeah. This this was what I what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, lenses, and especially one uh, one property of a lens, and that yes. is why are lenses round? That's well, not. That's you know. It's funny. You don't think about that. Well, you know, you know, you, your pictures are. are rectangular, right? The yeah. pictures are rectangular. Oh, that's a good point. You, you have uh, a uh, either square, square or yeah. rectangular photo. Why aren't the lenses square? It would yeah. make so much more sense, wouldn't it? It would. Now, I, and I remember my grandma. She had a she had a magnifying glass that was rectangular. So yeah, uh, I was like, okay, what, what? Okay, let's let's look at what that lens does and the, what it does it, it's it's a projector it sees what's in front and it projects that into the camera and if you look at what it projects in the camera it's an image circle it's a circular image yeah interestingly enough it is a circular image no matter what shape the lens is uh -huh. if you have a triangular lens you will have a circular image so we're the wasting camera. the corners you are wasting corners if you use a, a square lens. If you take a, sh it's an interesting property. If you take a shard of a lens, you smash up a lens, and you take just just like a like a like a, a triangular piece of that lens, it will still project a full image circle. It might not be as bright, it might not be as sharp, but it will still project a full image circle. What? 
Try that out. Try try no, it I'm out. No, I'm not with smashing a, a lens. Are you kidding? No, <laughs> you can try it. You can try it out easily. If you take like a post-it note and you stick it on the front of your lens and you make a little shape there, yeah. you will still see the full picture. It just won't be as bright. You will lose a bit of the picture, but not the, not the shape. So what makes the picture rectangular is the sensor. The sensor is rectangular and that's it sees only part of that image circle. Yeah. Which, by the way, old cameras like the original Kodak, for example, the first Kodak camera, that took round pictures. They gave you round pictures back because what? the lenses weren't the lenses weren't as good. What? So the the corners the corners were were kind of not sharp. And in in general, my mind here. <laughs> in general, rectangular photos are just more useful in our world because yes. everything is kind of angled. Now the lenses are, of course. And I, I, I had to look this up. I got that question. I was very, 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 um, yeah. I took a long time to really piece this all together. But lenses are made round because they are made on rotating machines, right? The, yeah, the mach they grind the lenses, them. They grind them. They grind them. Yeah. Well, cheap lenses are actually pressed lenses. So they, they, they press glass in, in special shapes. But most of the more expensive lenses are ground lenses. So they take a, a, a slab of glass and then they grind the lenses out with a, with a grinding mill. And then they polish them, and that is all made uh, done in a in a circular motion. So it makes perfect sense to have them uh, round. If you wanted to have a rectangular lens, you would have to produce it round first, and then saw the edges off. <laughs> that just doesn't work well. Um, another thing that's interesting is if you look at how the lenses work um, to create linear motion. Like if you if you focus. If you have a lens that lets you manually focus and you turn that focus ring, there is a like a, a threaded screw in there that slides it back and forth. So that that converts that circular motion into linear motion. And most lenses do this, do it this way nowadays. And for that again, it makes a lot of sense to have those lenses to be uh, round and not square. And one last thing is the bokeh. The, the out of focus part in the back of the picture. If you if you use a lens that has a specific shape, you can actually do this. You can cut out a shape, let's say, of a heart, yeah, and put it in front of the lens like a black piece of paper with a heart cut out, and yeah. then look through that. So you've created a pretty much in that moment you created a heart shaped lens, <laughs> and you put something out of focus behind your subject, a point light source, for example, of a Christmas tree or something. Then you end up having that heart shape in that bokeh. So that that lens would also reflect in the shape of the bokeh. And if you have oh, a square wait. lens, you get weird square shapes back there. You don't get a heart-shaped picture? No, you don't get a heart. The, the, as I said, the lens shape still keeps the same <laughs> image circle. But That's the out-of-focus so part that <laughs> is based on the shape of the lens and are based, of the shape, wait, wait, wait. based on the shape I of the aperture. I cut out a heart shape, put it yes. over my lens. So I'm shooting through a heart. I look through the viewfinder. I see a heart. But when yes. I take the picture, it's still square. Yes. There's no heart, except that the little sparkles in the back or the shape of the the out of focus of is heart shaped. Yes. And it's upside down. I don't down. believe it. And it's upside down. So make your heart right. upside, and that down, is upside right? down. So you make an upside down heart to get. This is <laughs> this is one of those techniques that photographers use a lot when they shoot. Uh, around around Christmas time, you have all these little point light sources, and then just imagine you have twenty point light sources. You have a heart shaped aperture. You will end up with twenty heart shaped lights around the person oh. you take a picture of, or a Christmas tree. Yeah, because that, that you have those point shapes. Oh my goodness! Well, it's oh. almost upon us. So, uh, or for Halloween, you could do uh, or that you could do pumpkins. <laughs> Well, oh, it it you, works. It works really well with point lights. You're blowing my mind. You're blowing my mind, my friend. So yeah, you, you have pictures up there right now. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm looking at some Flickr pictures. Uh, somebody cut out a butterfly. You don't get a butterfly-shaped picture. You get a picture uh, with butterflies in it. That's hysterical. Wherever the little dotty lights are. Oh, I gotta yeah, try point this. Light sources. That's that is something crazy. Take a black piece of paper and then. Cut it up hard. Cut it upside shape. down, though, or it'll be upside down. Well, experiment. That's that's a great, great playground. And city lights would be good. You could that would work, right? Any point Perfect. sources. Perfect. Chris, you're wild. You know that would actually be a technique you could use for an assignment this month. 
<laughs> mm, now I'm thinking. Now the brain is working. We're uh, we do this every month. Chris does this every month. He gives you a, a word or a topic to illustrate with your camera, and invites you to take pictures and submit them to our Flickr group. Flickr is a photo sharing site. Yahoo owns it, which means it's now owned by Oath, which is now owned by Verizon. It's very confusing. Verizon. Yeah. Anyway, it's still it's you go to Flickr.com, and uh, if you look for the group that says Tech Guy. You'll see you're in the right one. I think there's some other tech guys, but they're, the one with the, like 11 or 12,000 members, thousands of photos. Renee Silverman's the moderator. It's free to join Flickr, free to join our group. Please do. And then take some pictures that illustrate the word or concept uh, shadows. And, uh, and I think this technique might be an interesting way to experiment. I'm going to play with that a little bit. And then once you do that, upload it to Flickr. That's an easy thing to do. And tag it with the word shadows, then submit it to our tech guy group. Renee will take one picture a week. So pick your best one each week. And in a few weeks, Chris will be back from Norway, and we can review it. Have a great and wonderful romantic trip with Monica. <laughs> Thank we'll see you. you in a couple, and actually, we'll see you next week. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls still to come. 8888-ASK-LEO. Don't forget the website, techguylabs.com. I'll put some links up there to everything you need to know. Before uh, we brought Chris Marquardt in, we had Mike on the line from Maine. And Mike, uh, so tell me, but you, you're a consumer protection guy. I, I don't work in that field, but I'm very you help very people do it. it. I keep yeah. up with it. And I help all my my friends and anybody who you know I can help with it. So, what's I'm your concerned. reaction to this Equifax breach? There's no excuse for it. None whatsoever. You know how you, you talk about how you know their data needs to be uh, scattered or not scattered, but uh, hashed and salted. Yes. Um, have you ever been to a Waffle House? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, Equifax data and all the other ones, you know, all, all the, the, those, those, those agencies, it shouldn't be hashed and salted. It should be hashed and salted and scattered and smothered <laughs> and covered and chunked and diced and peppered. I agree. Because they can grab agree. all our data without our permission and can do anything they want with it without Precisely. our permission. Precisely. We talk about privacy all the time and worry about Google and Facebook. At least with Google and Facebook, we know what we're getting into. But without your knowledge, and I bet you a lot of consumers don't even know that TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, uh, this new one I'd never even heard of, Innovus, are, are keeping track of all this very personal information. They have your social security number, your driver's license number, your income, every credit card, every any debt that you ever had. Everything, your bank statements, everything about your life, they have, and they trade it, and they sell it, and you can't do anything about it whatsoever in terms of them trading it. Is there it any way, somebody it. said uh, that they uh, had, to, like, can you, you know, call or write or do something and say, please remove all my information from your database? No. can't do that. And if you were to do that, you'd never again be able to rent a car or buy a house or get a credit card. Or get insurance. Or get insurance, for that matter. That's right. In fact, in many cases, uh, you can't get a job. Employers will run a credit check on you before they hire you. Absolutely. Or, or you can't do it. You can't rent the house. It, it's yeah. really used very unfairly, and you have no control over it. Now, you talked about credit monitoring when you talked about this earlier. And credit monitoring is ridiculous. Nobody should ever pay for it. Nobody should ever get it. This is okay. So this is good because I do use I, I pay for LifeLock. I pay a lot of money every year for LifeLock. And what they do is they'll say, oh, you know, we spotted your driver's license on the dark web or this database has your email address. It's a way of letting you know that your information is being circulated. Why is that a bad thing? No, I don't want to talk about any of your sponsors. Any no, I, and they, I think they have I'm been a sponsor, but that's OK. No, be honest here. I want to know your I knew your honest opinion. In fact, opinion, I think I agree with you, so go ahead. Let you know what happens after it's happened. Right. It's telling you, yeah, somebody took your credit card. And what are you going to do about it, right? You can't do a thing. It, you're paying for absolutely nothing. It just tells you to do what you should be doing anyway, which is periodically checking your credit card statements, checking your credit reports. Mo you need to monitor your own accounts. Absolutely. When you get your credit card statement and you get your phone uh, statement, whether you get it online or wherever, most people just pay it and that's it or yeah. pay whatever portion of it. I, I'm crazy, but I go through it. I still get it on paper because it's easier for me. And I go through it with a highlighter and I check every receipt yeah, and make idea. sure that each one is mine. Yeah. And it makes a huge difference. You know, I have no idea how many times I found mistakes. But the thing that is important and that's 
it, rather than the credit monitoring, there's something called a credit freeze. And in the long run, it's going to be less expensive. And each one of these companies now, uh, offers a credit freeze. So there's two things you can do. Uh, there's the fraud alert. That's the lowest level, and that's free. And then there's a credit freeze. What's the difference? A fraud alert, again, will let you know. It's like when your credit card company calls you and says, you know, somebody used your card in, uh, at a, you know, you live in California. Somebody used your card at a Walmart in Des Moines, Iowa. Were you there? Nope. Okay, we're going to change your card number. That's a fraud alert. Well, that's, that's not that's, bad. I like that. That's a great thing. Absolutely, yeah. that's a great thing. But a credit freeze, and it, it there's different costs in different states, and I can explain that in a minute. What that does is it locks your data so that the credit card, nobody can check your credit or use your that information without your permission and without you giving them permission. Nobody can do, run a credit check on you without your okay. And you can lock it down with all with the three agencies. I've never even heard about the fourth until you mentioned I know. I know. In Ovis. I learned about that in a New York Times article about the subject. And when you want to get a new loan or you want to have somebody check it, you find out what agency they're going to use, and you go and you unlock it. They give you a passcode. You ah. can take... 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes, five minutes to unlock it over your phone. You can do it by calling in. You can do it by email. You can do it in all sorts of different ways. Now, the difficulty with this is, is that in many states, the maximum that it's going to cost is $10 each time you lock it and $10 each time you unlock it. And they're going to charge you for that in many states. But in many states, like in Maine, where I'm calling from, it's free. Yes, yeah, because your state, state legislature legislate. obviously made a law saying they can't charge for that, and I think that exactly. should that needs to be something every. Uh, let's make it a federal law. How about that? Just one one stop shopping. Let's let's write uh, your member of Congress. Yeah, it should be a federal law, especially after this hack. And with this hack, when they got in there, they mentioned in Maine that five over five hundred and twenty four thousand people lost their information in the state of Maine. Well, you know, there's only a million one hundred thousand. I think uh, I first of all, I don't trust Equifax and their numbers. And uh, it's almost always the case when these breaches occur that the numbers go up. We hear, oh, oh wait a minute. It was no, it was more than that. So uh, just I think the safest thing would be and it would certainly be a great way to stick it to these guys for everybody to assume that their data has been breached. Should everybody, not everybody would want to issue a credit freeze, partly because of the cost, but also partly because of the inconvenience, but you might want to consider it. You really should. And it'll also, if you do it, it's going to put these agencies out of business. Right. They can't sell your That's data their revenue. any longer. Yeah. And it's very, very important. Uh, the credit freeze is, is the most critical thing you can do. And the other thing that people should remember, as you mentioned, the credit monitoring that they are offering, do not by any means sign up. I wouldn't use it. Point. That's because basically giving them more. And you're in the terms of service, and the New York, uh, New York State has found this already, and they're going to fight it. The terms of service says you can't sue us at I that know. point. It it's an arbitration it clause if you sign up for their credit monitoring. Although, a huge class action Equ suit yeah, on. Equifax says, oh, that doesn't apply to the breach, just to the credit monitoring. However, I don't trust Equifax, and I don't think anybody should. So you, can't. you know, and and uh, so, uh, people have looked at it, and the the truth is, you you can't sign away that right to sue. So you, and there is already, I think, a seventy billion dollar uh, uh, class action lawsuit on our behalf being filed. This is gonna, this is really gonna put uh, Experian on the rocks. I hope, but all of the all of these credit agencies should be on notice. They need to uh, have stronger security. They they have a very high responsibility. And the question that I have about this that also has not been talked about, my credit's frozen, so I'm, I feel really good about that. But when I, your credit is frozen, they issue you a passcode. Now, when they stole my data, if they stole my data, first of all, was it stolen because it's locked? Probably, because it should be in the same database. Oh, wouldn't locked. that be interesting? <laughs> and if it's stolen, did they get my passcode? They could unfreeze too? your credit. And we don't know the answer to that because Equifax has been singularly unforthcoming with information about the hack, what they got, right. who got it, how they got it. Uh, and they're going to have to be, you know what, we're going to have to put their feet to the fire. They're going to, I'm I, sure, be called to testify in, in Congress and so forth. And to be fair, I can understand, and I think you can too, that they might delay it some because perhaps they're working with law enforcement before they're announcing it. But not three months, I don't think. It's been, you know? five, it's been five weeks. I feel like they, uh, 
Look, companies don't want to admit this kind of stuff because of all the you know negative publicity they're getting right now from me and everybody else and from you. Uh, so I understand their uh, reluctance, but in my opinion, when this stuff happens, you need to be very uh, aggressively proactive and do and, they, and do the right thing, and they have not. And they need to come forward, especially with those three executives before it was announced, yeah. selling their stock in yeah. the company. Shocking. Those guys need to be fired for malfeasance. They need to lose any pensions that they had other than their own contributions, and they need to have no golden parachute and, 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 and nothing, no, no – uh, no parting pay. Yeah. They need to be let go and not be allowed to work in that field again for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Uh, well, Mike, I'm glad you called in uh, with a little clarification. I have, uh, and we'll put a link to it, uh, the state of California's information about credit monitoring, credit freezes, and fraud alerts, the distinction between them. And it's very helpfully has links to the th big three, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, uh, to their credit freeze pages. So you can go directly there. Um, and, and can I, I leave you on a good note on something positive that you should please, know about? Please, let's cheer me up. You said you love trains. Have you ever taken the Rocky Mountaineer Railroad train from Vancouver to Calgary? No, but that sounds wonderful. I've, I've heard you that know, there's also a Trans-Canada train, isn't there? Because, there is, but yeah. the Rocky Mountaineer is like taking a cruise on a train. I'll do it. You have, there's a dining car below in the car that you're in, and there's a beautiful windowed car on the top with wonderful guided tours going through the most beautiful scenery you've ever seen. You can go from Calgary to Vancouver, but go the other way because the scenery only gets better and better and better. Don't miss that, Leo. Mike, You'll love it. Thank you for the travel log. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Another hour to come. More of your calls right after this. <laughs> awesome. That sounds like a great trip. Thank you, Mike. That sounds awesome. Goes right through Kamloops. <laughs> Kamloops. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, and why am I saying that? Because it's time for a word from our sponsor, our fabulous sponsor, WordPress.com. WordPress is my blog host. WordPress hosts... 28% of all the web pages on the internet. Every day, millions of people go online searching for you, for your business. Boy, if you're a business and you don't have a website, you're going to say, I know, I have a Facebook page or I have a Twitter page, but that means they own it. And things happen. You need a place you own. It's kind of like that email domain. You need a website. Create a website at WordPress.com. They host it. They keep it secure. They keep it up to date. And now your customers can find you you can even get a domain name, you know, myfastplumbing.com uh, or whatever it is. And your customers will love it. You, I know you don't have any, if you don't have a website, I know the why you don't. Because you say, I don't, wanna, I don't want to learn it. It's too complicated. WordPress is easy. You go there. In fact, go there right now. WordPress.com slash tech guy. Start a site. Pick a template. And that's it. Now you start putting stuff up there. You could change the template anytime, make it look any way you want. It's got built-in search engine optimization. That means you'll start showing up right away on Google. It's got built-in social sharing, which means your customers can share you, can help publicize it. There, of course, are all the WordPress plugins we come to know and love. And with a WordPress.com plan, expert support's there to help you focus on what matters, growing your business. Find out why 28% of all the websites in the world run on WordPress. Get started today, 15% off your new plan at wordpress.com slash tech guy. 15%, that's a good deal. 28% of all the websites in the world use WordPress, including me. That's my site, leolaporte.com. Wordpress.com slash tech guy for 15% off. And we thank them for making the Tech Guy podcast possible. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, you want to talk high tech with me. Another hour to go on the Tech Guy Show. And I'd love to hear from you. 888-827-5536. Will's on the line from Bradford, Pennsylvania. Hey, Will, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo, thanks for taking my call. Thanks really appreciate it. My pleasure. So I have a, a little bit of an issue, and uh, I've got a story to go along with it, so hopefully I don't confuse you. 
Um, my mom is the secretary at our church, so I'm really looking for an answer for her. Okay. Um, and we have a Gmail email address for our church, and we also have, like, multiple email lists. Maybe this one's a prayer group. Maybe this one's a committee. Yep. Um, so when she's at work, she's got, obviously, her uh, desktop PC, and it's running Chrome, and she's using Gmail. But when she goes out, maybe uh, important prayer request or something comes through, uh, but she's not in the office. So she tries to use her iPad. The issue being is the Gmail app doesn't let you access said groups. So I'm looking for... Well, wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. The Gmail app lets you access everything that's on your Gmail. Uh, huh, I, don't, I don't know then because I've looked... I've tried finding it so many times. Like you go... To start a new message, and there's nothing anywhere. Oh, 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 you mean in the contact list? I get what you're saying. I thought you meant yeah. reading the emails. You mean to create the, the, the list? Well, first thing yeah. I would say is if she's sending those lists out at work, <laughs> well, she works at the church. The church doesn't mind? Or does no, she work no, no. somewhere else? Well, she works at the church, but then if, uh, if she's out, then she'll take care of a. Okay. A, uh, prayer yeah, you should just understand when you're using a computer at work, the work, uh, you know, work controls what you do with it. And there, she, you got to be careful about things like sending out email lists from an employer if they're not for the employer. But since she works at the church, I think that's OK. Uh, they'll allow it. Uh, so you're saying that the uh, the con the the names in the address book are not showing up on the iPad, but they do show up on her desktop. Well, what what it is is the groups of contacts. Yeah. Like this one might be a bo uh, a group that's a board or whatever. She can access them any at any time on Gmail on the on the computer at work. But when you get to the iPad, she can't get to those groups. Like you go to send a new message to, but you can't select that group. Yeah, that and sounds like a failing do, a failing of the uh, the uh, i iOS app compared to the... She could, of course, launch her browser, and it should still be there. If she launches Safari on the iPad and it goes to uh, now Gmail. That's the thing. Now, that's the thing, because she's tried to do that through Chrome and, I believe, Safari as well. And it used to work. Ah. She would go in on Safari, go to Gmail, log in, but, of course, request the desktop site. And you used to be able to click it just like you would click on the desktop and it just won't do it anymore. So I'm wondering if there's like an app that would somehow sync those contact groups or... Uh, well, there is a crazy workaround I can give you. <laughs> but uh, it, in general, I think using Gmail to maintain those groups is probably not ideal. Probably you'd want to use a mailing list creation tool. She might even... How big are the groups? Um, between maybe the biggest one might be somewhere between 50 to 75. Yeah. At some point, Google's going to complain about large group emails because, of course, spammers do the same thing. 50 is pretty small, but at some point, most mailing companies don't like to send out large groups of email. So at that point, you might want to look at something like content, constant contact uh, uh, programs designed for mailing lists management. Now, let me give you the workaround. It's something she can do. She can create a single contact for the group in her, uh, con you know, Google Contacts. Just, you know, name it the name of the group. And then put all of the email lists n names into a single email with commas in between each. So create a comma-separated list of emails to, to, uh, in, in, for that contact. And, and so it's a little weird. It's a workaround. But now that single contact, you know, um, you know, uh, fellowship group, will she'll send one email to that contact and, and Google will expand that single email because it's comma separated into all the different in, individual emails. Okay. I think, I think that will work. Uh, I'm told that that will work. But in the long run, she's going to want to look at something like Constant Contact or MailChimp, one of the program that supports this specifically and mailchimp has a free tier she's small enough she could use the free tier and it just is going to do a big a better job of it because you know all email providers are very sensitive about sending mass emails out
They don't want to be party to spamming. So Mailchimp is, right. I, I think, has the free tier that will she will uh, she will be under small enough to to use. There may even be, and I bet you there are nonprofit mailing list managers for churches and things like that. But this okay. is short term workaround. Since she likes Gmail, she knows how to use it. Create one contact fellowship group, and then in the email field, put all the emails separate, each one separated by a comma. All right, I'll, I'll tell her to give that a try. She give it a try anyway, and that would be in the Gmail app. It's interesting or that Saf I say Safari doesn't, <laughs> huh? Or should I say I'll give that a try? Yeah, because anytime you'll any set it up. Breakdown, <laughs> I'm the one. You're, you're the tech support person, and that's appropriate. Just just remember, she taught you uh, how to walk, so you, you, that's right. you that's owe right. her a little bit. <laughs> that's what I remind myself every time I'm doing tech support for my mom. She changed my diapers for two years. <laughs> I owe her a little. I, all right, I'll be patient. I'll be patient. It does seem to be a, a, a weird limitation in Gmail, and I be, I'd be willing to bet that the reason that's there, is they're, they're really hesitant to make you let you create uh, groups uh, because they don't yeah in fact there are limits i'm looking at the you you may even reach this you have reached the limit for sending mail and gmail if you send an email to more than 500 recipients in a single email or more than 500 emails in a day you're gonna have to wait a day before you can continue to send the other thing that google recommends and it might be the really the better long-term solution is create a google group it's funny how, you know, there was Yahoo groups and Google groups. There are a lot of these uh, tools out there, and they've all been kind of for either forgotten or put on the back burner. But Google still does Google groups, and it allows you to create a group that, uh, sh you know, she can be the only person to send email to the group. But you can also do it with other things with it, like organizing meetings, and you can even have the group mail to each other. And I think in a lot of cases... You know, it's a bunch of people who know each other. They may want to also participate in a more of a discussion. So groups.google.com is Google Groups. And you can create a new group that would be essentially like the mailing list, but would have additional capabilities, including a calendar, which I think is, a, a, is very useful. And, of course, there, there's a, it's mobile friendly. You can, uh, you can use uh, your mobile device with it and so forth. They have a mobile. Uh, I don't think they have an app, but they have a mobile site. So that's another one to take a look at. And uh, in fact, maybe that even is a better choice than something like MailChimp or Constant Contact. Take a look at Google Groups. I have to feel I feel like any moment now Google may put this out of its misery. I don't think they've done anything in years to improve it, but it's still there. It's still working. I've used it for years. You know, I uh, used a Google group for my or maybe it was even a Yahoo group for our poker group. You know, we met once a month to a bunch of the guys to play poker and it's a great way to just kind of send out a we said i would send out a reminder email and uh, it was it was a good, good way to do that are there is there another group solution like google groups and yahoo groups that's maybe better supported let me know leo laporte the tech guy I am going uh, on a little vacation uh, next week and the week after. However, we will be well covered. First of all, we have a brand new show for you next week. We recorded a number of calls, and uh, I will also record after the Apple events my thoughts on the Apple iPhone. So I will be able to talk about that. I'll also have the Galaxy Note 8 uh, by then. I get it Tuesday, so I'll have a review of that for you for next weekend. Brand new show next weekend. Never before heard, anyway. <laughs> The following weekend, I'm pleased to say Rich Demura from uh, KTLA, the Los Angeles uh, TV channel. He's a tech guy there who was at CNET for years, will be filling in for me. Rich has never uh, filled in for me uh, nationally before. He's filled in on the uh, KFI, our, our mothership, the L.A. station. Uh, so Rich will be here in two weeks. I think you'll enjoy it. I know, uh, well, much to my chagrin, he seems to be very popular with you. <sighs> enjoy. And then I'll be I'll be back after that. Doing even better, trying to trying to be as good as Rich is. Let's go to Alaska. What do you say? Claire's on the line from Anchorage. Hi, Claire. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Did I push the button? I did. Are you there? Hello, yes, Anchorage. There. there we go. <laughs> hi, hi, Claire. Hi, how are you? I am well. How are you? 
you know, getting ready for two weeks vacation, so they must be well. Yes. Hey, I have a burning question, um, and it's this. I had a Yahoo email account, which was going along swimmingly, and then all of a sudden one day, Yahoo sent me a little, when I tried to log on, it said, there has been some unusual activity, oh. and let us send you a super code or something to your recovery phone number. And um, the trouble is that my recovery phone number, um, mea culpa, I didn't change it when I disconnected the phone. So the, the the recovery phone number they had was disconnected, and I cannot seem to get uh, that code in any so, way. So uh, Yahoo, uh, of course, has been acquired. They were sold and uh, purchased by a Verizon they're now part of the Oath family. <laughs> I don't know what that means. It's just a terrible name, but that's what they are. And the mail uh, has gone through some troubles. Uh, you may remember that uh, Yahoo leaked. Uh, uh, I was, it seemed like a billion uh, customer records some months ago. That may be related to the notice you're getting. Right, right. They've been yeah. notorious for poor security for years, however. In fact, mm -hmm. whenever somebody called me and said, I think my email was hacked, First thing out of my mouth, are you a Yahoo Mail user? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. a couple of things. It may be, now I know you have given everybody that address, so you don't want to lose that address, and I, I understand that. Uh, but it may be time to consider moving somewhere else before it gets worse. First thing I would try to do is a log into just Yahoo in general, not Yahoo Mail, but Yahoo in general at yahoo.com. Okay. And see what happens when you enter your name and password. If you're able to log in, then you'd be able to go into your account and change the phone number. Well, right, but that's what it won't let me do. Well, logging in through email, but I wonder if you just go into yahoo.com, see if you can log in there. Uh -huh. You see what I'm saying? As opposed to the Yahoo Mail account. It's the same account, right. but it might be easier to get in through there. I would try that. You may also, they really ought to have... You understand they're trying to protect you. And yeah. uh, uh, so, in fact, a lot of times when you log into services, you'll see, and it's a little annoying, but you'll see it especially happens with financial institutions. Is this still your information? That's why they do that. Because they know people don't update this stuff. Who remembers what phone number you gave Yahoo five years ago? Right. right. Did, you, did you have a Yahoo account proper, a Yahoo mail account proper, or did you have it through an Internet service provider? No, I went directly through Yahoo, okay. and um, it was only a year old. Oh, it wasn't even that it old. Okay. It wasn't that old. Okay. Um, and uh, So you have, uh, uh, we're going to put a link uh, in the show notes at uh, techguylabs.com to ways to recover your Yahoo account. Did you ever give them secret questions? You know, they've never asked me for that. Okay. They went straight into the that's fine. recovery phone number. As far as I'm concerned, that's fine because uh, I think that's the worst system ever. Yeah. Uh, because <laughs> people use their mother's maiden name and stuff that could easily be discovered. You know, if, you're, if you do get, and almost everybody uses it, the whole idea is people forget passwords. How can we make, we need to authenticate them. How can we authenticate them in a way that they won't forget? Oh, I know. Ask them the name of their first girlfriend or boyfriend. They'll remember that. But the problem mm -hmm. with is these are not very secure. Uh, usually the actual answers to these questions are easily guessed. So I don't like that system. So what I recommend people do with secret questions is put in gibberish. And that's why you need to put a uh, use a, la a, 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 a password vault like LastPass. That's the one I use, or 1Password or Dashlane. There are bunches of them. Uh, because a password vault will store all that gibberish that you put in there so that you can recover it. Here's, uh, here's what you might want to do. There is a Yahoo recovery page that uh, you, need, you can use your mobile number, your recovery phone number, or your recovery email address. Yes, and unfortunately, I didn't never give an you never email, gave them one. email address no. because I don't want I didn't want my accounts linked. I have two or three. Yeah, years. no, I understand why you didn't do it, and it's not your fault. But, well, they they just get you, you know. I, I, I is there a human you can talk? No. To that can <laughs> well, there might be. There might be. Uh, you you one way around this. If you sign in from another device that you have signed in from before, it may recognize the cookie and say, "Oh yeah, she's okay," and let you in. At which point you can then change your phone number, 
or provide only, a secondary address or something like that. The only thing that was different was that I signed in from a different state. I had traveled with my right. laptop. As soon as I they see that, the they go, oh, that's not right. And, uh, you know, right. she's on an IP address we don't know. But did you ever use your phone or something else to access your Yahoo Mail account? That may be okay if you're back home and you used it before. They may not give, go to that second level of urgency, in which case you can log in and quickly before anybody notices change that phone number. Yeah, I've tried that. Okay. It doesn't work. Okay. They still they still want to send me. Uh, in fact, I just did it now with a regular sign in while you were on the phone with me. They still send me call with the code and they give the phone number. Ah, uh, so frustrating. And the, the phone number, you know, is it's gone. It's just gone. You know, there are Yahoo uh, support emails and phone numbers. Uh, I guess at this point, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then ultimately what I would suggest mm -hmm. is you switch to Gmail or some other service and have your – the nice thing about yeah. Gmail is it will collect your mail from Yahoo Mail. So people who still email you at Yahoo Mail, you can – and as, and I always advise people in the long run, the best thing to do is to own your email address. Register a domain name. It's about 10 bucks a year. Make it your family name or whatever, but own your email address. Almost all the registrars who will do that will let you bounce any mail that comes to that address to Gmail or Yahoo or something else. But the thing is, you can, you know, if you say, oh, I can't get my Yahoo account anymore, then you can go in and say, from now on, forward it to Gmail and you won't lose any mail. So this is a long, the long term solution is own your email address. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, use Twitter. Maybe uh, maybe they'll respond to a Twitter query. So that's another another thing to do is Yahoo has a uh, Twitter. Yahoo support has a Twitter account. Uh -huh. And that uh -huh. might be, in fact, in general, that's the best way to, to get to companies because they know it's public and they can't okay. really blow you off in public. So it's okay. ya at Yahoo Care. At okay. Yahoo Care. Uh, and 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 they also at at that Yahoo Care site on Twitter they they offer a link to the Yahoo account help page that might give you some additional support options and recovery options. At Thank you Yahoo very Care. much. Yeah, I, I, you have. I'm sorry. Oh, how does one go about owning your own domain name? So you go to a registrar. Um, we our sponsor is a good one. Hover h o v e r dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could go, there are lots of these guys. Dotster is another good one. GoDaddy, you've probably heard of. If you go to hover.com, uh, you pick a domain name, you can search for it. Uh, you know, it could be your last name.com. Probably that's taken. Uh, that's ideal, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have, you know, you could then have Claire at your last name.com be your email address. The thing is, you can pay for uh, Hover to get to collect your email. But what I have them do is instead of having them do my email, I want to still use Gmail for that. What I have them do is anytime email comes to Claire at your last name dot com, send it to Gmail. And so it's almost instantaneously bounced to Gmail. You collect you go get your mail at your Gmail account and you use something like Claire fifty six ninety four XYZ, something completely random as your Gmail account. The uh -huh. reason you do that is so that spammers can't guess it. It's really a private email. You don't give that email address out. You give out Claire at your last name dot com. And uh. if and if at any point you say, Well, I'm tired of Gmail, I'm gonna go to someone else, uh, all you have to do is go to hover dot com and say, Okay, from now on when mail comes in, send it to there. Send it to a different one. So it's an email reflector would be probably the best Excellent. way. Yeah, or redirector. And that by doing that, you now own your email address. And so forevermore, you know, you don't have to change it ever again. You just right. you just change where it sends the mail to if you feel like it. Excellent. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. I hope you can get it fixed. <laughs> Me too. I, yeah. Thank you very much for My all your My pleasure. Help. Take care, Claire. Wow. Have you been watching the, uh, the, the news, the videos, the YouTubes of Hurricane Irma? Man, that's scary. Why do they... <laughs> I feel bad for these poor reporters. Why do they put those guys and gals out there? I guess for them, they, they, it's exciting, but it also seems very dangerous. The wind and the things and the waves and the, jeez. Poor Anderson Cooper. I just feel so bad for him. He, he said last night, he said, we go out there so you don't have to. 
We stand here so you can see what it's like because it's too dangerous for you to come out. But what about you, Anderson? 88, 88, 88, 88, ask Leo. That's why I do the Tech Guy show. There's no disaster that I would have to show up for. Oh, my goodness, the, the Intel's changed the, how they make their chips. I'm standing in front of the Intel plant. No, I wouldn't have to do that. I wouldn't mind going down on Tuesday to the Apple event, but they don't seem to want me there. So that's all right. I'll be watching that from afar, too. It's safer. Matt on the line from Denver, Colorado. Hi, Matt. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Matt, are you there? Is it me? Hello? Oh, there's Matt. Hi, Matt. Oh, this is actually Mark. Hmm. That would explain your reticence. I'm up, I'm sorry. I apologize. I misread your name. Hi, Mark. That's all right. Been watching you uh, since back in the Tech TV days, so thank you for all the stuff you do. Thank you. 20 years since Tech TV started almost. Amazing. So, yeah, a question I have for you. Um, I'm possibly interested in getting a DSLR camera. My dad has an old SLR camera, the Olympus OM-1. Oh, what a he great that camera. Can... That's a classic, yeah, but it's a film well, camera. Yes, but was wondering if it's possible to get one that could use the lenses from that, possibly yes. through an adapter or something. Yes, 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 yes. In fact, uh, now I don't think Olympus has maintained. So DSLR, which is, stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex, that's the digital version of that OM-1, which is a single lens reflex. The idea is that you're looking through the lens when you look at the viewfinder because a mirror is kind of taking the light and bending around. You look through the lens so you see what you're going to get. And uh, and the, the advantage, the other advantage of these cameras is they have interchangeable lenses. When you buy a point and shoot, that's a fixed lens. It's built in. Its capabilities are, you know, never going to change. That for most people, is fine. But pros and people who are serious about photography sometimes like to change a lens. Go from an extreme wide angle to an extreme telephoto or... Uh, you know, maybe want a lens that works better in low light or better for, uh, you know, space photography, whatever. So DSLR... Like fun things like the fisheye lenses, too. The fisheye lenses are so much fun. The glass is the most important part of the camera, the lens. You know, the ca in fact, in the digital era, you know, with film cameras, the back didn't change that much. You know, they would maybe make a, a knob different feel or whatever, but the technology was very simple. But nowadays with digital backs... The technology is upgraded, just like your computer every few years, massive upgrades. So if you've invested in great lenses, when you, you, you know, you, that glass doesn't change, optics don't change, but the cameras do. So you're really making the investment in the glass. You're going to keep using it with new bodies all the time. The problem is the mount. And I don't know why, but camera companies, I probably because they want a monopoly on their lenses, will use unique mounts and they'll change over time. The only company, to my knowledge, that hasn't changed is Leica. They, you can take, in fact, I have taken old Leica cameras. I have a 50, 60 year old Leica camera. It's, it uses a modern Leica lens. It mount is exactly the same. It's amazing. Unfortunately, I believe Olympus did change. So you will have to use an adapter. But I have used uh, old OMD uh, or uh, OM1 lenses. I, I had an OM1 in my youth. It was a beautiful old camera. Your dad's lucky he still has his. I've used old OM1 lenses. Uh, on modern Olympus cameras, on their pen cameras, with a simple adapter. So, uh, in fact, I'm trying to remember, it might not even need an adapter. In any event, you can. And does Dad have a lot of OM-1 lenses? Um, I think he's got like three or four of them. Yeah. Here's the, here's the downside, <laughs> uh, which I found. You know, I was able to, you can find these old film camera lenses uh, uh, very inexpensively on eBay couple of things. If they've not been well cared for, they may be a little cloudy because mold grows inside them. So you want to look at the optics and make sure they're really crystal clear. You could have them cleaned. You can send them to somebody who will clean them. Uh, the other problem is, frankly, we've gotten better at grinding lenses. Modern lenses are more accurate, have less aberration. Uh, zooms are better. In general, lenses are much better today. On the other hand, it's really fun to shoot with an old OM-1 lens. So I'm trying to remember. I, ha I bought a 50 millimeter 1.4 OM1 lens that I used on one of my Olympus cameras, and I'm trying to remember. I may not have needed an adapter. I don't remember. What? What's your? Do you have a DSLR body yet? 
No, I was wondering if you had any good recommendations for ones that I could either straight up use the lenses or use the adapter. So let me see if uh, if I first of all let me see. You know that would be a good reason to get an Olympus. Uh, by the way, the Olympus uh, Micro Four Thirds cameras are extremely good. My wife uses a OMD, which is the digital successor to your dad's OM1. She uses the EM1 Mark II. It is an incredibly impressive camera. They preserved the, the you know, one of the things about the OM1 that was great, it was a small, small camera. It was very compact and portable. Olympus has done the same thing with their digital versions. And they also have a great range of lenses. So start with dad's lenses and maybe up to over time buy a few uh, digital lenses for your uh, OM1. Let me just see if I have an OM or OMD, I should say. If I have an OMD, do I need an adapter to run? I'm going to check because, you know, I don't remember. I, I can. Yes, it looks like. You, oh, you do need an adapter. All right. So you will need to use a uh, OM adapter, which is probably not hugely expensive. These don't have any optics themselves. They're literally just a physical adapter that takes the old lens and mounts it on the new camera. But th that means you don't have to buy an Olympus camera. So I would certainly look at how much, what's your budget? Um, I don't really know. I don't want to be spending like $40,000. No, 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 no. Also... You won't. You're going to save money on glass, remember. Uh, yeah. The OMD uh, EM1 Mark II is about two thousand dollars, though it's a fairly expensive body, but it's state of the art digital technology. If you're really well, serious, uh, definitely within my budget. Okay. Abilities, so. If you're serious, boy, I think that's the first place I'd start. Plus, Dad would appreciate it that you stick with the Olympus brand. Uh, I am a Sony shooter. This is a, both Sony and Olympus are what we call mirrorless, which means they can be smaller. But there are, I think, it's the future of photography, and both Sony and Olympus are investing heavily in the technology in the body. So the bodies have really improved. Of course, for years, Nikon and Canon dominated DSLRs. I think they've fallen a little bit behind, frankly. Uh, but Nikon does make some very good, uh, as, as does Canon, entry-level DSLR bodies. Canon's uh, EOS range is, uh, you know, uh, the, the um, T, whatever it is now, T5 is very good. The uh, Nikon uh, D3200, for instance, very good. But you know what? If I... If I were buying a camera today and starting from scratch, I'd probably get the OMD. I really like these Olympus. Okay. So, you know what? Take a look at that anyway. Uh, I, I shoot a Sony A7 and A9, which I really like. Nikon also, as I said, has some very good uh, bodies that are not, you know, I mean, the top-of-the-line Nikon bodies can cost five to $10,000, but you can get down there in the $1,000 range. So there's okay, some, sounds good. Yeah, there's some very good choices. That's great that your dad has those lenses and is willing to, to, to give them to you. I think that's fun. And you just get one adapter and all the lenses will work just fine. Excellent. Yeah, and Olympus makes an adapter for those lenses. It's pretty fun shooting with the old lenses. I, the, the 50 millimeter I got, it was probably 50 bucks on eBay. It wasn't very expensive. It was never quite as clear as a modern lens with the modern optics. I think that they've, maybe the grinding and the computer generated technology has gotten a little bit better. 8888 Ask Leo. One more segment to go before we wrap things up for this weekend. The last weekend before the new iPhone comes out. <laughs> I always like saying that. As if the world is going to change on Tuesday. Hey, maybe it will. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, Olympus says... <laughs> Olympus OM system lenses and lens accessories can be used on the new e-system DSLRs and the pen digital cameras when mounted with the appropriate adapters. So if you're going to do uh, the OM1 lens with the uh, OMD, you'll need to use an MF-1 OM adapter. The pens have a different adapter, the MF2, and that's the one I was using. I was using it with a pen camera. So let me just see how much an MF1 OM adapter is, just out of curiosity. Their link uh, on that page is dead, but I bet you Amazon sells them. Yeah, $83. And there are other companies that make these. But you can see it's there's nothing to it. It's just a mechanical... <laughs> Thank you for... <laughs> I love how Amazon enlarged this picture. 
by clicking on it, <laughs> same picture, just a lot more white space. Uh, yeah. Tech Guy Podcast brought to you this week by 23andMe. I got to log into my 23andMe account. My mom, I showed my I, my mom was watching the show, uh, I think yesterday. She said, "Oh, I want to see your genetic report." Well, mom, I'm going to send you a 23andMe kit so you can add your genetics to my genetics, and we can find out together uh, what we've got. 23andMe is so easy. You don't have to go to a doctor or a lab. There's no blood involved. You just spit, literally, into a little vial. You send it back to 23andMe.com. They analyze it, and they will give you a complete genetic report. What's great about this is you log in again from time to time, and as they learn more about what g the genes mean, and boy, we are in a, an amazing time. We're learning so rapidly. You'll get more information. So, for instance, I found out that 4% of my DNA comes from Neanderthals. The rest of it comes from Europe, by the way. But what that was interesting because until very recently, it was unknown whether Homo sapiens, our species, could even interbreed with Homo neanderthalensis. They found that out. They found some Neanderthal DNA. They did some analysis, and they found out that uh, what the Neanderthal DNA was. And now, with analysis, genetic analysis like 23andMe, you can actually see, oh, yes, my deepest, darkest ancestors mated with Homo neanderthalensis, and 4% of my genetic material comes from them. By the way, that's not a bad thing. Turns out those Neanderthals weren't just cavemen. They, some of the, they had some pretty good skills. It's really fascinating. You can find out what parts of the world you come from. You can even trace your haplogroup as it migrates uh, you know, across the continents. You can get ancestry composition, haplogroups, Neanderthal ancestry, your DNA family. You can use the DNA relative finder to find long-lost relatives. I found a second cousin I didn't even know about. And of course, you completely control it. It's with your permission. They'll even, if you want, if you have other DNA analysis tools or your doctor asks you, you can download the actual raw data from 23andMe and, and run your own analysis on it. But I love the stuff 23andMe comes up with. All sorts of interesting stuff. It's simple. You just give them a little sample of your spit. You mail it back to the lab and the kit that came with it. They'll review your results, put them online within six to eight weeks. And you can check back again and again, as I have been. I did this years ago. I must be four or five years ago when they first started. And it's, it's so great to see more and more information all the time. And yes, Mom, I will share this with you. 23andMe.com slash twit. Find out where you come from. Find out who you are, what genetic traits you, uh, traits you have, and a whole lot more. All sorts of stuff at 23andMe.com slash twit. It, it, it's really fun. I did it for myself, but it's also a great gift. Just keep that in mind for the holidays. 23andMe.com slash twit. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. I didn't mention, I should have, uh, if you buy a modern camera and you use an old-fashioned film camera lens, most, if not all, of the features of the modern camera will be turned off. You're not going to have autofocus. You're not going to, you know, it's not going to know anything about that lens. You're going to be using it in a very manual mode. That's okay. I mean, I, I like to do that, but you probably should be aware. One of the reasons you generally buy new lenses with a new camera is you want to take advantage of all the features. Now, modern lenses have Sometimes the lens itself has optical image stabilization built in and, and all sorts of stuff. So, um, 8888 ask Leo, some, just something to consider. I love using these old lenses, though. I think it's fun. You get a unique look, too. Right? David from Pleasanton, California is next. Hi, David. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I have a, uh, this is an interesting situation. I have an iMac. Okay. Uh, and I have two PCs. I have a, a, a Dell PC with 32-bit. Yep. And a Dell PC with 64-bit. Okay. Uh, I connected the iMac to remote desktop to both of those uh, those PCs. Okay. I can see it on my Mac screen. Yeah. Uh, and I have uh, Microsoft Office 2016. Both uh, I'm using Word and Excel. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, running those are running on the Windows device. Those, those are work. Those are running on the Windows device. Okay, exactly. Yep. 
Now, when I on my on my remote desktop connection on the iMac, when I go to the PC, uh, the 32-bit machine, yeah, and I open up Word, and I highlight a, a bunch of text, and I can go to my font style and size, it gives it lets me preview as I go through the the, the list. Right. But on my 64-bit PC, it does not. That's weird. Does it work when you're using your 64-bit PC directly, not through remote access? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it does. That makes absolutely no sense because remote access, it's not like you'd have to have those fonts or anything installed on the Mac. You don't. Remote access is just giving you a window into what's happening on the PC. Well, now, I was told by the, the Apple Genius desk <laughs> yeah. that the iMac, the, the iMac is using its font list and graphics to show what we see on the remote desktop. That's nonsense. Okay. I think. <laughs> I know he's a genius, and I hate to second-guess a genius. But unless I'm misunderstanding, well, I believe when you're using remote access, in effect, not, all not, you... Not, not, not remote access, oh. remote desktop. Well, that's the same thing. You're using RDP. You're using Windows Remote Desktop. That window on your Mac screen has nothing to do with your Mac operating system. It's a window that connects to the PC and is displaying what you're seeing on the PC, right? Uh, except in this case, the 64-bit uh, PC, and I've tried it with another one. Yeah. Likewise, I cannot, I cannot highlight text in Excel or in Word. Well, that, and that's, it has something to do with the, the, the remote desktop on 64-bit 60, Windows. There's an error there in some way. It may be, I mean, who knows? It has nothing to do with your Mac. In fact, my suspicion is if you used remote desktop, in fact, you could try this on the other PC and accessed it, you'd have the same problem. All right. Try it and see. Uh, that, would, that would kind of destroy the uh, Mac genius's point of view because it, I, and it shouldn't have anything to do with the Mac. The Mac is not using its own fonts to render what it sees in remote desktop. It's not using any of its resources the remote desktop is a window. It's like you're saying, well, when you look through a window, the green on the trees is not provided by the what's outside the window. It's provided by what's inside. That makes no sense. It's You're looking through a window. Uh, unless I'm completely, I, mean, I, I guess I could be wrong and completely misunderstanding how remote desktop works, but one way to verify this is try it on your 32-bit PC and see if you have the same problem. Well the, the only other the only other issue is that if I utilize a uh, log me in uh, go to assist right then you're uh, not um, using Windows RDP you're using log me in and does it work on log I me in no, I have no trouble with it yeah so that's that confirms my suspicion which is the 64 bit RDP client or server that you're using on your Windows machine isn't doing something right and in fact it's not unusual to have bad rendering on remote desktop. Uh, not sure how you fix this. It seems to me it, uh, you're using, I presume, the built-in remote desktop in the in Windows 64, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes, I am. Now, yeah. is it better to? Uh, to I mean, by the way, the chat room saying you could just install Office on the Mac, <laughs> and you wouldn't have to do this. Right. Okay. Right. That's a that's one solution. Was is they do make Office 2016 for Macintosh. It's not exactly identical, right. but they do make it. Uh, it could also be something wrong with what program are you using on the Mac to access RDP? Um, from what I can tell, it's the built-in. It's, it's something built-in. Built okay. Built so it could also be something that Apple's not doing right. Although that doesn't make sense either because. Uh, you should see an exact rendering of what's going on on the PC. Uh, well, here, here, what's your opinion of using remote desktop? That's fine. Log me in. Just use log me in or team viewer or something else. They're doing it right. That's the difference. That's all. There's it's something it's something wrong with the RDP either the client on the Mac or in my opinion because it works fine with 32-bit windows, right? Right, and that's the same client on the Mac. In my opinion, it's the 64-bit Windows implementation of RDP is not working right. On the Mac or on the on PC? the PC? 
It could be a, 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 a incompatibility between the Mac version and the PC version too. I'm sure the Mac version is 32 bit. It could be something like that. But but in any event, yeah. If Log Me In works, use Log Me In. That's fine. It's exactly the same. It's just they use a, you know their own client and their own server. Okay. So yeah, or Team Viewer is another one people love. VNC is an open source, widely used remote access tool. You can get a VNC server that runs on your PC and a VNC client. Uh, I used to use, I don't know if it's still the best for the Macintosh. I just like the name Chicken of the VNC on the mm -hmm. Mac. And VNC Virtual Network Client is exactly the same. It's a remote viewer program. And that one's free. Team Viewer is free as well. Uh, I think Log Me In may still have a free tier. Just don't use Windows. It's, it seems to me, that, and I don't know what the genius was thinking. He's maybe sub-genius. But it seems to me the issue is is the server running on the 64-bit version of Windows. It's not doing the right thing. Uh, Chrome. Somebody's reminding me. Chrome has a Google Remote Desktop for Chrome. I think I would I would probably try this with VNC. I think VNC does a very good job. Get a VNC client on the Mac, VNC server on your 64-bit Windows. If RDP works, then use it. But if it doesn't, there are other options out there. I guess that's the that's the uh, answer. I think I have just enough time to say hello to Chris from Rancho Cucamonga. I only got about a half minute left, Chris. What what can I do for you? Okay, Leo. First of all, thank you for all your computer information. I just wish I could retain most of it. <laughs> it's all right. I'll be back next week. <laughs> well, I'll keep saying I repeat myself for that very reason. Actually, you know what? I'm going to run out of time. Hang on the line. I'll talk to you off the air, okay? Just hang on the line. Okay. I, d I do want to make sure I have time to thank our musical director, Michael Cozio, to thank our fabulous phone answering person, uh, Kim Schaffer, and most importantly, thank all of you for joining me each and every weekend. As I said, I'm going on vacation, but we have a brand new, fresh show for you next weekend. Rich Demura will be in here in two weeks from KTLA in Los Angeles, and I'll be back in October to share the tech with you. Thanks for joining me. Leo Laporte, The Tech Guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for The Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, this Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guy show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. What can I do, Chris? I have, I have a, a granddaughter that's a sophomore in high school, and she's come to the decision that she wants to take start taking professional pictures though she's never operated a camera before so <laughs> hey but what a, that's a great time to start okay but obviously you don't as this is always the case with a kid you don't want to spend a billion dollars on something that she may in six months tire of right so you want to you want her to feel like grandpa gave her something really cool what's your budget uh five hundred dollars okay um, let me think. So, is that enough? Oh yeah. Oh. oh yeah. I would say I'm trying to think what the best camera you could get her for 500 bucks would be. And and you want it to kind of look like a serious camera. Right. Um, it might be a little outside your range. The point and shoot that I use that I love is maybe a little more than 500 is the Panasonic LX10. I re I've recommended that before. I really love it. Um, oh, oh, look at this. This one is just in your price range. The problem is it doesn't include a lens. But this is an interchangeable. This is probably the best quality you could get in your price range. The Sony Alpha. A6000. It is an APS-C sensor, which is a big sensor, and it's an interchangeable lens camera. So 
you're going to have to get one lens to start. You're going to have to get a kit, okay. which will cost you a little bit more. Um, okay. But like five, like a hundred bucks more, you could get a a, a a kit lens. The sixteen to fifty, for instance, would be a good choice. Well, is it sixteen to fifty? Yeah. So I'm looking at Amazon. If you get the uh, the the base model plus one lens, sixteen to fifty five zero, it's five ninety eight. Uh, okay. But then, if she does get serious, she has a very serious body, and she can get more lenses. She can she can diversify, or you can get her more lenses over time. So this would be right at the high end of what you're going to get. I mean, this is a superb camera. This is actually what I gave my son for his high school graduation, I think. So, oh, great. So that's a very good, uh, very good choice. Does she have a computer? Yes, she does. Okay, so she has a way of getting these off because a digital camera. Here's another choice somebody's recommending. Actually, this is pretty nice, too. We'll put a link to this uh, in the show notes. This is from Costco. This is a Nikon D3400. What is it? And this is also 600, but it, it comes with two lenses. It's a nice kit because it includes also memory card, and she's going to need a memory card, so that's going to add, a, you know, 30 bucks to the overall cost. I'll put a link in the show notes, but this is on Costco. The Nikon D3400 DSLR camera with two lenses, and it comes with a carrying case. This would be a nice gift. Oh, great. Yeah, this looks like this. She got that. She would go, Grandpa, you took me seriously. Wow. She'd feel really um, kind of uh, honored, I think, by this. Yeah, and the, that, that the, sounds like a great idea. Good. What a nice grandpa. By the way, this includes a Nikon uh, online class, which she'll probably want if this is the first time she's used one of these. Learn a little bit about it. And the lens range it gives you is very, very good. It gives you a very broad range of lenses, plus a two-year warranty. This is a good deal. Costco has it for $599, Nikon D3400. Okay. I appreciate it, Leo. Hey, I think you're a great grandpa. Thanks for the call, Chris. Thank you. Take care.